to, uh, welcome everyone to this uh, virtual agenda club of the Physiological Society. Um, so today uh, we'll be presenting uh, this uh, paper entitled Zancocilin for Acidic Inflammatory Signal in Plasma Membrane and the Plasmatic Reticular Junction in Sensory Neurons. And today with me, uh, I have the senior author of the paper, Nikita Gamper from the University of Leeds, and the co author, Shia Habita from also from the University of Leeds, and senior editor, David Willis from the University of Edinburgh. So before starting, um, I just wanted to remind you how to get involved with the Journal of Physiology. Uh, so you can do it in several ways. Uh, one of them is hosting a future meeting of the Journal of Physiology uh, Journal Club as today. Uh, you can um, submit uh, one of your recently published article to the Journal of Physiology and uh, you can write a Journal Club article again. And for any question, uh, you can uh, submit your queries to uh, the two emails down below. Uh, so before uh, starting, I also wanted to outline our discussion is going to be today. So I will introduce uh, the, the session and the panelists, and then we're gonna go on with presentation of the article. Um, uh, then we will move on the editor comments. We will explain why this uh, particular paper was selected for uh, publication in the Journal of Physiology. And this will be followed by a Q&A session of around 10 minutes at the end of the session. And then you can join in, in a networking session uh, of which the link will be posted in the chat. And uh, you can submit your question all throughout the, uh, the session and this will be answered uh, at the end. Uh, you can upload your favorite questions and um, I want to tell you know the session will be recorded and will be available within uh, a week uh, from today and um, alongside with a feedback survey. So uh, just before uh, getting into the actual article I just wanted to quickly uh, uh, say why I've chosen this particular uh, paper for today's uh, journal club. Uh, so uh, I am currently a PhD student at the University of Leeds, so my work is quite uh, different from what is being presented today. Uh, so I work uh, on central and peripheral metabolism alteration, hyperdiet and obesity, but uh, I think what's uh, really important to consider in this uh, pathological state is that they usually come with a risk, uh, increased risk of chronic and debilitating inflammation, uh, both because of increasing body weight and fat mass and also release of low inflammatory uh, adipocytes, uh, adipokines and cytokines. And there are several studies that have shown that uh, inflammation uh, in the DRDs uh, are associated with an increased perception of pain in animals that have had hyperdietive and in absence of uh, obesity, fully developed obesity. And what I found interesting is that the, this paper explores a novel uh, molecular mechanism of how pain uh, is produced in the DRGs, not is uh, perceived uh, in the central nervous system. And in particular today, uh, papers is gonna describe um, how um, calcium nanodomains in the plasma membrane of, uh, in, in, sorry, in the junction of plasma membrane ER uh, is maintained uh, by juncticillin-4, uh, which is a contributor of inflammation uh, in pain mechanisms. So, I'll now give the word to the authors so they can uh, explain the work. All right. Um, can you see my, sli my slides and my pointer? Yeah, okay. All right. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Nikita Gamper. Thanks, Ariana, for picking uh, up this paper and um, Rosie and Physiological Society for hosting this uh, seminar. Um, I'm going to go through this paper as in a typical uh, journal club, um, perhaps. I'll start from acknowledging the team. Um, this study has been done across three different uh, institutions. Uh, we have uh, Alex, uh, Shab, and Fred, uh, and myself from the University of Leeds. We have a group, we have our um, uh, uh, China team in Hebei Medical University. I'm also cross appointed there, so it's not just the collaborators, but really a good um, colleagues of us. Um, uh, Han Hao is uh, um, particularly. Um, important for this study because he, uh, with help of the others there, uh, done uh, in vivo experiments. Um, and also we have a good collaborators and friends at the UT Health San Antonio, Chase Carver, uh, helped us with storm um, experiments. And of course, um, 
thanks to our funders. I'll start by introducing um, general thinking that led up uh, to um, this particular investigation and few other lines of inquiry currently running in the lab. We are interested among other things in localized intracellular signaling in sensory neurons. Um, a general question is um, to those neurons, but also in principle is how a large number of cellular processes can be regulated by a limited number of intracellular messengers. Um, in this little cartoon, what um, I put here is a very simplistic uh, um, cartoon where we have a cell. It has uh, calcium activated ion channel in the plasma membrane. And this uh, calcium activated channel is activated by the release of calcium through the IP3 receptor from the endoplasmic reticulum. Yeah? Calcium is diffusing freely through the cytosol and activating this, this channel and uh, cell response in a specific way. In a, such a simple um, cartoon, it looks quite uh, fine, yeah? But reality is in fact much more uh, complicated. It's perhaps something like uh, what I shown here, but uh, even this is a uh, um, uh, large oversimplification. In real uh, cell, we would have several types of calcium sensitive ion channels and plenty of other calcium sensitive proteins, kinases, transcription factors located in cytosol. We would have multiple pathways uh, through which calcium can be elevated in cytosol through the ligand gated uh, calcium channels or voltage gated calcium channels at the plasma membrane or through at least two types of the release receptors in the, in the plasmic reticulum. There is also mitochondrial calcium stores. So it's a very complex system. And if um, all the calcium sensitive proteins would be sensitive to all uh, sources that can elevate calcium in the uh, cytosol. So this um, signaling would have simply uh, no sense. Yeah? For that reason, um, calcium signaling and other type of intracellular signaling must be compartmentalized in the cell. Uh, we are also looking into how this uh, com compartmentalized signaling uh, would work or can work in a somatosensory neurons, which are huge cells, you know, from the fingertip uh, receptors in the skin to the first synapse in the uh, um, dorsal spinal cord. There is a one meter or longer uh, distance in, in, in mammals. And of course, what's happening here, it's not what's happening in the cell body or it's not what is happening in the uh, first synapse of these neurons. So compartmentalization is even more um, of, a, of an interesting issue for such a large cell like that. And of course, uh, we also um, uh, interested in uh, the ability of target those intracellular signaling cascades with some um, um, uh, novel pharmaceuticals in order to um, manipulate activity of those neurons uh, in order to uh, devise smarter analgesics. All right, um, let's go back to compartmentalization of the signaling cascades. And um, one example of such compartmentalization can be found in a specific uh, um, type of, of organelle, if you like, is where is a junctions between, between a plasma membrane and endoplasmic reticulum. Yeah? This cartoon form is here, but uh, on the left is um, electron micrograph for um, um, two DRG neurons. The neurons uh, cell bodies in the dorsal root ganglia. Yeah, here it's zoom up. So this is uh, border between two cells, and you will see that in this particular case, ER runs along the plasma membrane in a very close proximity for extended uh, duration, um, um, extended lens. Yeah? And in our lab, we spent. Uh, um, a lot of effort to um, try to understand what is located here, what type of signaling processes uh, are going on in these um, junctions. Um, we spent several studies trying to elucidate the um, signaling cascade from a particular type of G-protein coupled receptors called bradykinin receptors. And we um, characterized um, their um, that they are located in those junctions between the ER and plasma membrane, and also in, in proximity of the IP3 receptors, which uh, they activate by releasing IP3. Also in these junctions is calcium sensitive chloride channel, ANO1. Some, in some of these junctions, 
can be also found at TRIP-V1 uh, calcium um, channels. Um, it's a very robust um, uh, intracellular signaling hub res responsive to inflammatory um, conditions and responsible for some type of inflammatory pain. But in this study, we um, focused on a different aspect of the same broad um, uh, problematics. We wanted to know how the um, ER is uh, linked to the plasma membrane and whether it has anything to do with the ability of the store operated calcium channels to refill the ER with calcium upon um, GPCR signaling, which um, releases calcium from the ER. And here, junk feelings come into play. Actually, um, I didn't know much about junk feelings until a couple of years ago, maybe more than a couple, when I uh, went to a um, cardiovascular seminar, departmental seminar, and it was um, uh, about the junction between the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the plasma membrane in cardiac myocytes. And from there, I learned that there is a, a protein called junk 2 which links those two membranes together and also brings about um, uh, L-type calcium channels and ranadine receptors together, yeah? And I got very interested in this because it looks very similar to what we have with uh, ER in the DRG. And uh, when I went back to, to the office, first thing I've done, I uh, opened uh, Allen Spinal Cord Atlas, which is a really great database which shows you uh, uh, RNA expression in the spinal cord in, in the DRG. It's an unbiased database where you can just dial in a, a, a gene and it will show you expression, yeah? So I looked for junctifilin 2 and got nothing. The DRG is here. This is a spinal cord, yeah? I looked into junctifilin 1 and nothing was there. So I thought maybe it was just a false alarm. But then um, uh, actually junctifilins are four uh, members of the family. And when I uh, typed in junctifilin 3, there was already a good expression there in DRG. But junctifilin 4 was actually a huge expression, like really specific expression of mRNA in the dorsal root ganglion. So we went ahead and did some uh, series of immunostainings. Um, in the papers, there are many of, of them, but I will only show some essentials. We stained for all of four junctifilins. Junctifilin 2 was absolutely not there. It's only data here shown for, um, for evidence that we do have a DRG tissue here. Junctifilin 1 and 3 was present in some quantity, but junctifilin 4 was indeed very highly expressed in those cells. Then we looked for expression of um, um, components of the um, store operated calcium channel because those are expressed at the junctions of the plasma membrane and the ER. Those are in effect were our markers in the early stages of this, um, uh, of this study. We um, looked into ORI1 and STEAM1. STEAM1 is a calcium sensor uh, located in the ER. ORI1 is a calcium channel located in the plasma membrane. And again, uh, DRG express abundantly uh, ORI1 and it localizes neatly around the plasma membrane. STEAM1 was also expressed in, in a lot of the DRG neurons and they um, overlap in the same cells quite well. We then looked into the co-expression of uh, uh, GPH4 together with ORI1 or STEAM1 by double staining. And indeed, majority of the cells were positive for all three. So this is ORI1 GPH4 and STEAM1 GPH4. And on the bottom, there are merged panels. And you will see that again, around the plasma membrane of many uh, DRG neurons, you will see um, uh, a colocalization signal manifested as yellow in this case. Um, we cultured some DRG neurons and did uh, um, to, to get a little bit better background to noise and did iris scan microscopy. It's a little bit better than confocal, probably twice better for resolution. Not quite as good as uh, um, proper uh, super resolution techniques, but uh, twice better than confocal. And on those images shown here, we also did some colocalization analysis. Um, simple line scan shows you that there are maxima at the plasma membrane for both ORI1 and GPH4 or STEAM1 and GPH4. Below is uh, something that uh, is called um, intensity correlation analysis. Sharp uh, has uh, um, uh, run those on cells like that. Basically, uh, it compares the intensity of uh, pixels of two color, yeah? And 
if they are uh, randomly distributed, they would group around this dotted zero line. But if the both of them uh, skew to the right, it means that they colocalize, yeah, tend to colocalize. And it was the case for both types of proteins, or R1 GPH4, T1 GPH4. Pearson correlation also give you coefficient of, of about 0.7, which is good evidence of colocalization. So bottom panel is, uh, um, uh, I like it a lot. In um, quite a few of cultured DRG neurons um, stained for GPH4, you could see that they, um, the staining form some sort of like, um, uh, like a venous network around the plasma membrane, but at the, underneath the plasma membrane. So this is the Z stack from that cell also in iris scan. This is zero, one, two, three, four, five micron. And this is a, a composite image. And you will see that uh, this cisterna positive for GPH4 run underneath this, this um, uh, the plasma membrane. So perhaps uh, GPH4 is in the ER, but not randomly throughout the cell, but only in the fraction of the ER that goes up to the plasma membrane. However, neither uh, confocal nor iris scan gives you a truly molecular resolution, so we couldn't look for proper interaction between uh, either of those molecules. Therefore, we adopted um, two different approaches. Well, one is called proximity ligation assay, um, or it's called also in situ proteomic assay. It looks specifically for um, um, uh, physical interaction between two proteins. Uh, we labeled two proteins with, uh, with a probe linked to the pieces of DNA. And if the two proteins are close enough for the DNA to, to be ligated, so it can be ligated and the product of ligation amplified, and this will form a fluorescent puncta seen in, this, in, in those images, yeah? But uh, the ligation only happens if the two proteins of interest are closer than 40 nanometers uh, to one another. So here, what we looked at, A, uh, whether there is a proximity between STEM1 and GPH4, or, or I1 and GPH4, and B, whether this proximity can be triggered by uh, calcium release from the stores, uh, such as uh, in response to bradykinin stimulation. And in both cases, we got the uh, answer as yes, yeah? So you can see there is a, um, already some degree of clustering between STEM1 and GPH4 in uh, unstimulated cells. But if you stimulate cells with bradykinin, this clustering is hugely increased, like three or four fold in the case of STEM1 GPH4. And the same is true for ORI1 and GPH4. So indeed, in response to store depletion, proximity between the GPH4 and either STEM1 or ORI1 is increased. The same result we got with STORM. This is stochastic uh, reconstruction optical microscopy. This is a truly uh, uh, um, single molecule super resolution technique where each puncta represents a single molecule localization of either STEM1 or GPH4 in control condition or after bradykinin stimulation. And you can see again that there are clusters already uh, existing between these two proteins, but after bradykinin stimulation, these clusters become more prominent and more uh, frequently found. Yeah, this is the statistics for that. In the next uh, uh, series of experiments, we ask what if what happens to the clustering between um, uh, STEM1 and ORI1, which we know happens in response to um, store depletion during the process of uh, um, I-crack formation or store-operated calcium uh, channel formation. If we um, subtract GPH4 from the equation by knocking it down with uh, siRNA. We tested few siRNA oligos. One was better than the other. In this case, siRNA2. Um, we tested it with immunofluorescence or, or with Western blot. Knockdown is not perfect, but significant, yeah. So next, when we had our um, uh, efficient siRNA uh, uh, defined, we knocked down GPH4 and we looked whether it will uh, disrupt bradykinin-induced interaction between ORI1 and STEM1. Let me see if I can have this. Yep. So indeed it was the case. In C, this is a control experiment where we use scrambled oligo, non-targeting uh, siRNA. Yeah? And here is uh, proximity between ORI1 and STEM1 tested by PLA. 
in control condition and after bradykinin stimulation. You see that the proximity is pretty much uh, uh, stimulated uh, uh, significantly by bradykinin. But after knocking down um, um, GPH4, it's no longer the case. So indeed, GPH4 is important for um, induced interaction between um, uh, STEM1 and RI1. Are there any functional consequences of getting rid of GPH4? And we tested it in few ways. Uh, one was with the calcium imaging, we can, uh, where we can uh, directly measure the um, store-operated calcium entry through the ICRAC STEM1 or I1 uh, channel complex. Um, what we have here is uh, um, calcium imaging on cultured DRG neurons loaded with 402. We start the experiment um, in uh, a zero calcium extracellular solution, and we apply bradykinin in this uh, zero calcium solution. This produces store release from the ER. Stores are not refilled because uh, there is no calcium coming from the outside. But when we reintroduce calcium into the extracellular side, there is a huge influx of calcium detected as 402 signal through the uh, store operated calcium entry or ICRAC channel. Do we know for certain that it's ICRAC? Yes, because uh, in the presence of two different um, uh, ICRAC blockers, SINTA66 and YM, this uh, store operated calcium entry is completely abolished. You can see it here. Yeah? Now we repeated this experiment, but instead of applying um, uh, ICRAC blockers, we uh, applied siRNA for GPH4. In this experiment shown here, in blue, blue line is uh, uh, siRNA knockdown, black line is scrambled oligocontrol. You see that bradykinin uh, response is almost not affected, just a little bit, uh, a little bit smaller, not significantly. But the calcium, uh, 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 store operated calcium entry is reduced more than twice, yeah, which is also summarized here. So again, those data are very consistent with the PLA experiments. Uh, removal of GPH4 prevents the formation of crack channel complex and also reduce significantly store operated calcium entry. In the next experiment, we asked, um, we were thinking around um, um, putting it in, in, in more physiological context. First of all, we noted in, the, in this experiment that uh, um, initial responses to bradykinin were not particularly well um, uh, re reduced. What it means, it means that in condition where there is no uh, background activity of G-protein coupled receptors, um, stores can still be refilled over time. Yeah, Circa pump perhaps uh, is unaffected and it just keeps pumping, pumping calcium, even though um, um, well, in, in the state of equilibrium where no um, um, store depletion occurs, yeah? But in acute situation of store depletion, the store refill should be compromised because, because the crack channel is not supplying enough calcium, yeah? How can we detect this? We thought that pro uh, to um, design an experiment in which we will uh, produce two store depletions in, 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 in sequence and see if the second one will be affected uh, uh, by uh, GPH knockdown. Yeah? GPCR, including bradykinin, are very susceptible to phenomenon called tachyphylaxis, so desensitization, meaning that each time you apply bradykinin in sequence, you will have few, uh, smaller and smaller response. Tachyphylaxis is very rapid for bradykinin receptors in, in particular. So in order to test this paradigm of repeated uh, store depletion, we um, Introduce the uh, induced store depletion through two different GPCRs. First, through P2Y receptors with ATP, and second, through bradykinin receptor with bradykinin. Yeah? Uh, application of ATP is done in calcium free condition to prevent store refill A and B also to exclude P2X receptors that are uh, ionotropic uh, ATP receptors that are expressed in the DRG, but in the calcium free conditions, they want to contribute to, to, to calcium signal. And again, we uh, performed this experiment in control cells and in cells where GPH4 was knocked down, which is in blue. Responses to ATP were somewhat reduced, but not significantly, again, similarly to bradykinin. Uh, so then um, after store depletion, first store depletion, we introduced calcium. So there is a store operated calcium entry. We let it uh, plateau, and then we applying bradykinin. 
And the second bradykinin response is really, really significantly reduced, as you can see here, uh, with GPH4 knockdown. So yes, acute uh, GPCR signaling, especially where you have uh, a repeated presence of different type of uh, um, GPCR agonists, will be compromised at least in the short term if you get rid of GPH4. Whether it has anything to do uh, to um, um, in vivo responses of DRG neurons. In order to test this, we stepped up to in vivo uh, knockdown of GPH4. We conjugated our oligo uh, siRNA to cholesterol to make it self-deliverable, how they call it, yeah. Uh, cholesterol uh, conjugated uh, siRNA can be injected intraticularly or in DRG specifically, and is taken up through the plasma membrane of the cells and can do its job. So we tested the efficiency on, on culture. It worked really great. Intraticularly, it worked a little bit less efficacious, but still 40-50% uh, knockdown, which is great, it's significant, yeah. So what we're doing then, we, um, we took three uh, groups of animals, one with vehicle in, intraticular injection, one with scrambled uh, siRNA injection, and one with um, uh, GPH4 siRNA injection for subsequent in, uh, injection over four days to ensure uh, uh, in vivo knockdown. And then we inject bradykinin into the hind paw. Bradykinin is a uh, powerful inflammatory mediator and very painful substance also, yeah? Uh, injection of bradykinin produce very strong pain response, similar to or even greater than capsaicin, for instance. And what we are doing, we are observing the uh, amount of pain behavior induced by bradykinin injection. We just simply stop watching the time uh, animals spend flinching and licking and biting the paw, which is proportional to degree of discomfort it experiences in response to the injection. Um, observation is over 14 minutes, in order to gain uh, an idea about the kinetics of response, we also been the observation in two minute uh, uh, periods. And what we are plotting here is uh, uh, amount of pain behavior during first two minutes, second two minutes, third two minutes and so forth after the injection. In blue is, the, our, is our siRNA injected animals. And what you can see here is that um, Initial response to bradykinin during first two, four, four minutes uh, is unaffected by the knockdown. But uh, what knockdown does, it, it produces much faster tailing off of the effect of the bradykinin injection, yeah? Which is again consistent with our idea that it's not the initial response of the GPCR ligand which is compromised by GPH4 knockdown, but it's the ability to sustain this response because the calcium refill is compromised. Yeah? Um, if you, if we, when we quantified the overall duration over these 14 minutes, so the overall duration was also significantly reduced, also not that hugely, because the difference is here is, is in the decay uh, time, actually. Um, importantly, the mechanical sensitivity or thermal sensitivity was not affected by GPH4 knockdown. And it's uh, really um, good because uh, mechanical sensitivity or thermal sensitivity has nothing to do with GPCR signaling as far as or stores or, or any of those mechanisms as far as we, uh, we can tell. Finally, I would show a cartoon that Sharp has produced and it's really uh, great, um, which summarizes the overall signaling part of what I've been just telling you. We think that uh, there are junctions between the plasma membrane and in the plasmic reticulum uh, that brings together um, ion channels in the and receptors in the plasma membrane with responsive element in the ER. If we stimulate bradykinin receptors, it will activate IP3 receptors and produce calcium release from the ER. This in turn will produce clustering of ORI1 and, uh, um, and um, um, three, uh, uh, steam one, sorry. Uh, in pink here is our GPH4. Uh, this clustering will activate crack channel and produce refill of the calcium stores through the circa pump. And if we kill the GPH4 with, uh, with knock, knockdown or knockout, it would perhaps uh, disengage the, uh, the, uh, the ER from the um, uh, plasma membrane, or in other way, uh, impaired the ability of um, 
Steam one to interact with ORI one and hence hamper the story team. That's me, thank you very much. By the way, Shab is present here. So for Q&A, uh, uh, he will be able to chip in, especially on um, some of the methodical, methodological um, aspects. So I guess it's my turn, is it, Ariana? Yes. Okay, so um, I was asked to, to make a few comments about why the paper was uh, accepted for publication. So um, I'm David Wiley, I'm the senior editor, and I handled the paper uh, when it was submitted to uh, the journal. And um, I'm going to say that actually initially the paper wasn't accepted. Um, and this is, this is, this is a common um, uh, outcome for initial uh, submission of a manuscript to any journal, not just Journal of Physiology, um, whereby the manuscript undergoes um, what's known as a peer review process. Uh, we have two expert, generally two expert referees that make comment on the, the manuscript, pointing out the, the positive and the negative, and then uh, with the um, commentaries and, and the critique that they write together with a report from a reviewing editor that uh, Journal of Physiology, and in this case that was uh, Thomas Ellender, uh, who's at Oxford, um, I reached a decision and my initial decision was to reject the paper based on the reviews because there were some questions raised um, about you know, some of the findings as to whether or not um, the, 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 the interpretation um, uh, as presented was really robust enough in terms of the data that was initially presented. And I've got the referee's reports here. I'm not going to embarrass um, uh, Nikita and uh, Shihab by, by reading them all out. But one of the critical things was to do with the identification of juncture filling four, as to whether or not you know, the, the expression levels and, and to, to what extent they could be absolutely sure that juncture filling four through the antibody staining was uh, a critical player in this story. Now, in the absence of a knockout animal where junction film four was not expressed, um, the referees asked um, uh, the authors to go back and try alternative approaches to determine uh, the expression uh, of uh, junction film four, and specifically the antibody was actually picking up uh, junction film four. And that, that was one. There was a couple of there was other points that was made in terms of other models. Um, uh, in terms of the the um, uh, the, 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 the nociceptive uh, responses, where they actually did perform experiments, but uh, these these experiments were were a bit inconclusive. I didn't feel that they were they were actually proved one way or the other um, in, in terms of the job of the four. And I was I was happy to go with the experiment uh, and the data that were presented. So. Um, why, why then was the study? I mean, okay, we had we had we had reports that they were from from uh, referees. We had revised manuscript, and I reached a decision to accept the paper. Now, clinically, why was it accepted? Because there's a lot of very good science done, but it doesn't mean to say that it will always be accepted for publication in the Journal of Physiology. But critical, actually, what Nikita said at the start of this was the question: the question, how is her signals, especially calcium signal cells? compartmentalized. So it's a, it's a fundamental question in, you can think of it as cell biology, but also in physiology as to how our signals are generated and then have specificity. The second thing I wanted to point out, out was that he actually got some of the initial ideas um, from attending a, a seminar in, um, in cardiovascular physiology, uh, where the role of juncture filling who had a role in the sarcoplasm particular, and that prompted him to think uh, about the, the potential role for juncture fillings in his uh, area of interest in terms of looking at calcium signals within the DRG. So the question that's been asked is of interest. It's of interest to a wide readership uh, within the journal. And then he went from, or and, and the, the authors went from a story which was identifying that junction film four was a key player in bringing um, these partners together within the cell, the contact between the plasma membrane and the ER, looking at ORI1 and STEM, uh, 
But critically, we are the journal of physiology. So we need to have, not, we're not the journal of cell biology. I mean, critically, it's the sort of completion of the circle uh, within the study that ultimately ends up with what I'll call the behavioral experiment or the, the physiology experiment um, that, that showed that if there was an, uh, an SI RNA knockdown of junction group four, that attenuated the response uh, to uh, bradykinin. And that was critical in, in, in having that physiological response at the end that we could then relate back to the role um, of junction group uh, four. So that's a sort of a, a brief commentary on, on, you know, why initially the paper was of interest, uh, that while it was rejected, it was felt that the authors could address the comments. There were some other more minor comments and they're, they're actually still equally important because uh, the, the, the journal has a requirement in the way that data are reported. Um, so you would see um, on uh, many of the bar graphs, uh, there was individual data points included so you can actually see the spread of the data and um, these were not included in the first submission. Um, uh, so there's, there's a lot of sort of general housekeeping uh, rules that we need to, to ensure that the manuscripts comply with because ultimately we need to be sure that the, the, the studies that we publish, um, that people can, you know, they will each reach their own interpretation, but equally that the data are transparent to the readership as well. And that's one way of doing it. And every paper nowadays that is published in journal of physiology also comes with a supplemental file that is a statistical summary uh, that actually uh, states what statistical test was performed, what was the hypothesis being tested, uh, and whether that hypothesis uh, was, you know, or the, the, the null hypothesis was either accepted or rejected within that, that test. That's also provided uh, as an aid uh, to try and ensure that data are robust and transparent within not just the Journal of Physiology, but many other journals requiring uh, this full transparency and accessibility uh, to readership. So people want to see the data and actually want to reanalyze the data, they're actually perfectly entitled to write and, and ask for uh, data files to look at the, the, the data and they can, they can make uh, uh, a reanalysis of that. So I will end there uh, just now. Thank you very much. Uh, so. Now I just want to remind everyone, if you can submit uh, questions in the question and answer box uh, in the down part of your screen. Uh, in the meanwhile, I have a first question for you. It's from Holly Smith. Um, she said, thank you, thank you for the super talk. Uh, what would you expect to see from overexpression of GPH4 in some of the sensory neurons? What do, uh, would you expect to see increased or sustained sulcate? which uh, might result in sustained inflammatory response or something else? Well, that's an interesting question. We didn't try that. Um, perhaps interesting indeed to, to or express, which is easier to, um, to knock down. What to expect? It's an it's, uh, open question because in order to increase the storopurated calcium entry, you need perhaps more uh, uh, steam ones and ori ones there yeah if you just simply uh provide more scaffolding between structures that are already there maybe nothing gonna happen or equally plausible is that when the um uh, the structure is made more stable so the um refill would be perhaps strengthened hard to speculate but in, it's interesting question to, to test and not that impossible so probably we will Shall I guess it will also be interesting to see if um, in some kind of chronic pain condition, if you have more than two fillings as well, that's another line that we could look through. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question myself uh, for Shihab uh, about the storm technique. Yep. I, I've, I'm very unfamiliar with it, so if you just wanted to expand a bit about it. Okay. Thank you. Share something so these were the, the techniques that uh, we use. So we've got the PLA kind of Nikita explained it pretty nicely. Um, but for the storm, uh, the reason that it's classed as super resolution is using conventional uh, microscopy. 
you fl um, uh, excite all the fluorophores and you can't resolve proteins that are next to each other in your signal. So the way that storm works is that you activate subsets of uh, your of, uh, fluorophores and then you build up an image and that's where the reconstruction comes up from. Uh, so, and then you turn off these subsets and then activate another set and you get basically images that would look like this to give you these really nice um, high resolution images. So these can be up to like 20 nanometers, even uh, better resolution than that as well. So it's a really good technique if you can use it. And it's really kind of helped us in a few different studies as well. So I, I just uh, want to add that what you see in storm picture is not actual um, molecules. It's a coordinates of the molecules, yeah. So as Shap said, so you're only exciting a, a very small proportion of individual molecules that gives you a diffraction limited spot on your um, uh, uh, micrograph. And uh, it would have intensity in this, roughly in the center of the spot and you label it and that's your uh, um, resolution limit, which is none. You can, that's as, the resolution limit is as large as your uh, point that you can, you can put in, in, on your map of the cell. Mm. Thank you. Uh, I had another question that was very, uh, <laughs> very broad in general, probably. But um, how do you think like, uh, the finding of this uh, particular uh, molecule uh, in DRDs, how do you see that would be applied in terms of like therapeutics? Is there, it could be could it be a, a, a potential target? Is it? Yeah, well, um, this finding is very theoretical. Um, stepping in right right away to therapy would be perhaps a bit premature, especially because. Um, it's not only sensory neurons where this uh, uh, particle conjunctifilin is expressed. It's expressed uh, uh, generally high in the nervous system as well. So if you uh, um, start messing around with conjunctifilin system globally, so this perhaps will not be a great idea. I think a next question would be uh, down the line of what uh, somebody asked us here and what Shab uh, uh, alluded to is to see whether expression of junctifilin is compromised in, in any particular um, or enhanced in any particular pain conditions. And if we know that, so perhaps from there, we perhaps can uh, figure out the next step. But I want to say, by the way, that uh, cholesterol um, conjugated SH or SIRNA knockdown is closing in to a therapeutic application. It's uh, uh, on pair with ODN antisense nucleotides and some viral delivery. This is a plausible way to manipulate gene expression in humans as well. Yeah. So if we know what exact condition we have, we can target our junctifilin at. Yeah. So then next step would be to, to find the way how to do it. Okay, thank you very much. I don't see other questions in the Q&A box. Um, I've posted in the chat the link to the networking session. So uh, if anyone is interested in joining uh, that and speaking to those, uh, you're very welcome to. Um, beside that, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. And thank you to the panel, uh, to the panelists. Thank you very much for having us. Mm. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.